Hi, and a really warm welcome to this RICS webinar, Exploring the Value of Commercial Real Estate within the UK Government's Leveling Up Agenda. My name's Megan Walters, I head research for Allianz Real Estate, and I'm truly delighted that our uh, audience is extremely international today. We have registrations from Argentina, Australia, Canada, Hong Kong, Singapore, Italy, uh, Mexico, and the United States, as well as here in the UK. So commercial real estate with over, with over 60 billion pounds of value added to the economy every year, over 15 billion pounds worth of tax revenue to the government and employing over a million people, the UK's commercial real estate sector is a vital part of the economy. And we think it has a really big part to play in the UK's, in the UK's leveling up agenda. So in this session, we're going to talk about what actions can be taken, what are some of the opportunities, what might be some of the headwinds that we can do to drive commercial real estate forward. So joining me to discuss how towns and cities can compete on the international stage and how commercial real estate can be a crucial vehicle for people, places and prosperity. I'm really pleased to be joined by the people that you can see on the screen in front of you. So first, John Neal, Head of UK Research at JLL who's going to talk about how cities compete on the international stage. John, do you want to test your mic and say hello? Yes, hello, Megan. Looking forward to having this discussion. Lovely. Thanks for joining us here today. Next, we have Jill Skidmore, Real Estate Transactions Director for Global Workplace Solutions at Coca-Cola. And Jill's going to talk about site selection, which large UK employers might want to look at in terms to drive UK employment in the UK. Jill, would you like to say hello? So I don't think we got you there, Jill. Do you want to try one more time? Oh, sorry, I forgot the mute button. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. No problem. That's why we have a, a small test run. Uh, next, Cathy Reynolds, Director for City Generation, Regeneration and Development at Belfast City Council. So we're going to hear some first-hand some successes and challenges from Belfast City Centre. Cathy, do you want to go ahead and test? Yes. Uh, yes, Megan. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us. It's really great to have you here representing the local authority and local government side um, of what we need to do for this agenda. And then last but by no means least, um, a slight technical issue with the camera. So we have Chris Perkins, Head of UK Capital Markets at M&G Real Estate, one of our big insurance firms, um, talking about unlocking investment value. Chris, would you like to say hello to the audience? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Looking forward to this session. Great. Thanks, Chris. So let's remind ourselves what the levelling up agenda is. So on the next slide, we should have a, here we are, a short summary. So the point of the levelling up agenda is around productivity, pay, jobs and living standards in particular by growing the private sector. So it's about boosting the private sector to aid productivity, pay and living standards. The second pillar is around improving public services, particularly in areas where it's weakest. The third pillar is to restore a sense of community, local pride and belonging. And the fourth pillar is around empowering local leaders and communities. We've got some background noise if people could go on mute. Brilliant, thank you. So those four overarching themes make up the, the sort of 12 pillars um, that are the 12 mission statements within the levelling up agenda. So the RICS has put in a lot of work into this area and has done two reports over the last six months. And we'll put this slide up again at the end so you can make a note of the links. Um, here's my copy of it, just to prove that this is real time and we, we test these things out. So the first report is on the size and value and scale of the UK commercial real estate market. So the numbers around the 60 billion in terms of added value to the economy each year, the 15 billion of tax revenue, the numbers I cited at the start sit in the first report on the left hand side of the screen. The second report on the right hand side of the screen is the RICS's response to the levelling up report. I think it's a great report written by one of the one of the staff members here at the RICS. Um, and it highlights the 10 key policy recommendations for both government and industry, including making the kind of 12 mission statements binding, which could be quite important in the fast moving political environment that we have here in the UK at the moment. And also in particular, how to address the UK housing shortage, as these are essential elements of the UK agenda. 
So the links will be sent around at the end and I'll pop the slide back up at the end. So let's just take a moment to think about where we are in the current situation on the next slide. So the current state of play, as I've said, the UK political situation is somewhat fast moving at the moment. Uh, yesterday, our new Chancellor for the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, for those outside the UK, that's in effect our finance minister for the UK, uh, said that the government remains committed to access for all to economic opportunity. Um, I put in the Financial Times graph, which looks back at regional inequality back to 1900, right up to the present day. And you can see the north of the UK remains somewhat at the bottom and that London has sort of rather escalated away from the rest of the pack on the chart. So this is definitely an area that is still extremely relevant. Simon Clark, MP for Middlesbrough South and East Cleveland, has replaced Greg Clark in September as our new head of department for levelling up housing and communities. So it's well worth a look at the DLUH government website to see what the government is up to. Um, Simon Clark is the sixth housing minister in four years, so we really would be great to have some sort of binding commitments. The government website shows the priorities for the government around things like building safety, quite understanding, and of course, levelling up. And it also notes the the fact that the local authorities can now, since the 2nd of October, so relatively recently, apply for investment zone applications. Um, investment zones might have tax incentives over the next 10 years, such as relief on business rates, lower national insurance, um, employer contributions, and the government's um, phrasing is around simplifying planning rules, including perhaps reviewing some EU uh, requirements, which might still be in place, um, and, and some wording around, as they describe it on the website, onerous national and local planning policies. So something to think about. So I became interested in kind of cities and this urban regeneration idea around levelling up. Um, I've lived overseas for many years in Hong Kong and Singapore and relocated back to the UK relatively recently. And I was interested in cities and city density and productivity and how this might be addressed in the levelling up agenda. So on the next slide, this is some work that we did at Allianz, in fact, with uh, JLL. So if we go to the next slide, there we are, looking at city densities. So during the, during the COVID crisis, we spent some time looking at city densities. Sorry, if you just go back one. Thank you. So um, looking at city densities. So this was around uh, which cities we thought would be most resilient uh, to the work, uh, most resilient in terms of office markets. And so we spent some time measuring city densities. Because if you have a vibrant, dense city, and I know Cathy in particular might talk to this about the requirement for housing in city centres, we felt that might help cities. So very briefly, we measured global density in 47 cities globally, but only one in the UK, which was London. So generally, dense cities are in Asian locations, Tokyo, Beijing, Shanghai, Singapore, Hong Kong, all 10 to 12,000 people per square kilometre measured at a 20 kilometre radius. Uh, New York, we put New York at the bottom on the on the left hand side. So New York, about nine and a half thousand people. Most other US cities are more sort of four and a half, three to four thousand people per square kilometre. The two most dense cities in Europe are London and Paris, both at about six thousand seven hundred kilometre uh, people per square kilometre. Um, and then at the bottom, we've shown Munich. So all the German cities and many cities across Europe look sort of a lot more like Munich at about one thousand seven hundred people per square kilometre. If you go to the next slide, we've popped up kind of the equivalent maps for Leeds and Newcastle. We did this work at separate times. So these are based on the same kind of area, even though the colours look slightly different. So Leeds and Newcastle, um, and we've done an estimate, thank you to John and the JLL team for this, um, at about 1,300 to 1,400 people per square kilometre. So the reason for putting that in there, and again, that's at the 20 kilometre radius, was to kind of think about does density help productivity? What do we need to do in the heart of centres? Um, the numbers, as you can see, in the hearts of those centres are a bit more dense, where you've got the dark brown colours rather than the, the areas around the outside. So that's how I've come at the, uh, the you know, thinking about levelling up agenda, and that's what sparked my interest in it. And so now I'm really happy to introduce each of the speakers, and they'll take a few minutes to run through why they're interested in it and, and, and the things that we described at the middle, at the beginning. So first I'm going to pass to John, who's going to say a few words about cities and productivity. 
Yeah, thanks very much, Megan. I'm, I've got a couple of slides as well. So if you go to the next slide, I will talk to those if that's okay. But the point about density, I think, is an interesting one because density can mean many different things. It doesn't surprise me that Asian cities are, are the most dense. But there's different sorts of density, and you, know, and you can see from that that Munich and um, let's go at the previous slide. Sorry, M Munich and some of the northern English cities are, are quite similar in density. But if you look at the patterns of density, they're quite different. So within the kind of 20 k kilometer radius, it's quite similar. You go to the centre, and you know, having walked around Munich a couple of times, the inner city is filled with desirable areas are full of apartment blocks, which is very different to the inner city of Leeds and even Manchester for that matter, where you have an affluent city centre surrounded by, you know, either low density um, kind of uh, social housing often in many cases, or just lots of big roads and so on without much going on, um, which seems to me a fundamental problem with a lot of a lot of North and, and Midland cities. But I'll come back to that in a second. This chart I've borrowed from Centre of the Cities, um, uh, do a lot of interesting work in this area but this is really gets to me a fundamental problem not for leveling up but more generally for the uk economy given that we're all looking under the sofa to try and find ways we can grow the economy um if you take uh generally across europe you know bigger cities are more productive so you know london and paris are obviously outliers but if you look generally across that line you'll see that the more you know the more productive european centers are generally you know places like lyon hamburg munich stockholm brussels etc and there's a clear kind of well I say it's massively clear but there's definitely a relationship between size and productivity now you'll see that um, for a start off all the uk cities with the possible exception of bristol kind of um congregate at least is a bit better as well tend to congregate around that kind of bottom part of the the chart but also you know Manchester and Birmingham in particular are the two largest regional cities and, and they're quite a bit bigger if you look at the wider conurbation than, than, than everywhere else you know, they're really underperformed compared to similar cities on the continent I think Lyon or Lille will be the ones you'd look to because Germany Germany is a very different place with you know a less dominant capital a much less dominant capital you know, and strong regional government and so on. And obviously, Germany grew up as a collection of city-states, so there's a very different history there. But France is the obvious comparison. And, you know, and France has similar problems. I mean, Paris, and to a lesser extent, um, some other cities are very dominant. And, and yet, some of those regional cities in Paris do better than UK cities. And, and for me, that's, that's a fundamental question. Now, some of that's going to be to do with geography. But is it also partly to do with something that's structurally different about British cities? And Central Cities have also done some interesting work looking at um, looking at public transport and density. And they found that um, you know, not only were Manchester and Birmingham in the central parts, not the wider city, but in the central parts, much less dense than Lyon or or say Lille. They also had fewer people able to access the centre by public transport or by walking. So effectively, you, British cities might look big on paper, but the effective, the effective size, i.e. who can commute into the centre, is actually much smaller than it looks. So we're actually artificially constraining our city's size by not having very good transport and by people living quite a long way away from the centre. I mean, there's a few exceptions to these in British cities. I mean, you can go to the west end of Glasgow, for example, there's a you know, quite a dense um, in a city area, which which is probably more like what you find in the continental city, but that's the exception rather than the rule. And for me, you know, the challenge for us to try, and it's not it's not a silver bullet. There are other issues behind this to do with things like, um, you know, I think devolution. French cities have more powers. They also have uh, more ability to raise taxes to fund things like tram networks, which, which have been a big part of um, French cities' rejuvenation over the last few years. And I'll come back to that in the questions, I think, if we get to that. And then also, um, you know, R&D spending, which is very skewed in the UK towards London and Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and like business R&D, actually, you know, Birmingham and Manchester in particular do very well in sort of business R&D spending, but that's not backed up by the public sector as it is in, in say, London and, and the Golden Triangle. But having said that, I think you know improving the density of inner cities, making them more desirable for people to live in, you know, is a, is a key challenge. I think, and, and and it's more than just about leveling up here. You know, well, it is about leveling up because it's about providing places within the regions that people can find good quality jobs, can stay in their regions, stay in their towns to achieve, and that will, will also be a washback of money into the peripheral places if you get the right public transport in. 
this is also a huge opportunity for the UK. And if I was in government thinking how, you know, we know we haven't been seeing very strong growth for the last five years, what can we do? I would really not be thinking of this necessarily just in terms of leveling up. I'd be thinking what a huge opportunity to grow the economy. If we can get these cities to punch at their weight, and I'm not just thinking here of Manchester and Birmingham and Glasgow, but you know, all the other red dots on there, you know, that's a huge opportunity we're missing. If we go to the next slide though, just thinking more generally about leveling up, you know, there's lots of different issues there that I think we have to tease apart. Um, and I think the maps that will hopefully come up any second um, will explain that. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, I have moved the slide over. I think it's just a slight delay. All right, okay. But, but I think you have to disaggregate this problem into a few different issues. So for a start off, there's the problem that we have that I've just diagnosed, that, that deprivation in British cities is really concentrated around the, around in the city areas. And that's often the worst deprivation in the country, uh, excluding some of the seaside towns. Um, but then you've got the other issue, I think, which is the North-South divide. So obviously you have, um, you know, productivity almost, on almost every metric, the North and to a lesser extent the Midlands really underperform. So, you know, deprivation by employment, these are government figures on the left hand side. You can see how concentrated that is, particularly, I think, in the M62 corridor, although you can see that the Northeast and the kind of really area around Birmingham doesn't do brilliantly either, as do some of the coastal areas. And then education and skills, which is, you know, probably even more fundamental than transport in terms of some of these divides. Um, you know, a similar pattern emerging. And, you know, part of this is also about, uh, part, of, part of solving that problem is about trying to encourage more people, uh, trying to improve skills, trying to improve training, but it's also about encouraging people to stay. And I think things like investing in transport and investing in a sense of place will help stop this, will help at least shift this huge movement you get from regional universities into London, you know, people in their early 20s. Um, which no one ever talks about when they talk about London devolution, by the way. Um, but is you know, it's a huge phenomenon that you know if we can encourage more graduates to stay or return to many of these cities, it will make a huge difference. Um, and then also, of course, is, and I think that solves the other problem that we have, of course, which is um, you know continuing regeneration, but also attracting more companies because you know, ultimately, and I'm sure uh, Jill will come on to this in a minute, but the you know. From what I've come across, the single most important thing for companies is, are the right people living there? Are they, can I get the right skills? Can I recruit? Um, and I think if we fix those two things, we'll have a much better chance of fixing that one. But I'll pass back to Megan now and then to the other panelists to discuss that in more detail. Thanks, John. That was really terrific. Um, really interesting around can you get people to stay and can you recruit? Can you keep the skills in the location? Um, so with that, let's move to the next slide. Um, and Jill's going to give us um, some information about what employers might be thinking about. Thank you, Megan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk to you today generically around what large corporates and corporates um, may consider in terms of making their location decisions. So it is quite complex and uh, a company would actually start looking into um, location strategy, I would say, two years before um, they take any action. Um, so as, as you can imagine, it is quite a complex um, and, and and um, forward commitment uh, in terms of their thinking. I've listed a few things here on the slide that um, a large corporate would consider and talent availability, as John mentioned, people um, just, just a minute ago, um, that, that's also quite complex because it's just not um, have you got uh, people, it's, it's really uh, what type of people, um, if you're looking for you know, um, high-end graduates, for example, what do they need? Um, you know, as, as John said, it might not be London, but it's certainly city centre, they may not have a car, you'd, they, you'd rely on public transport, the public transport needs to be cheap, it needs to be available, it needs to be near amenities. If it's it's more mature talent that you're looking for, um, then they may have families, in which case they might want to live outside of the centre, and they may have cars, and, and therefore it needs to be, you know, um, 
a, a different scenario and rooted that way, or there may be a, indeed a mix as uh, normally corporates have. Uh, and talent availability, so I've just gone through a couple of profiles of talent. Um, it's also in terms of their relative cost. And this may be, uh, it may not be on a global stage, but it could be. It could be regional within, say, Europe, um, and it could be um, national. And, and then within national, it could be geographic within a region. So there's a number of different levels that a corporate may consider in terms of um, the, you know, a, a real strategic decision in, in terms of location. Uh, and, and obviously then cost would come into it as well, the relatively, you know, um, what, what talent would cost. Um, I've listed a couple of other things which are really structural before you would even get to talent. And, and that is really, I'm going right down to the bottom because they're not in priority order, the strategic business waiting. So this would um, uh, take into account um, really the, uh, the magnitudes of the business, the key drivers of the business. Why? What is the work? Why do you need to be in that market? Um, is it, you know, do you need cross-border connectivity? Don't you, you know, it's, um, um, uh, it's really the, that um, factor is really driven through um, business strategy in terms of how you make money. And that, I would say, would be a 40% weighting of all the criteria. That's the reason why you'd be looking to, to locate. And then um, you'd think, OK, so we do have a business need. So um, is it possible? And then you'd look at the legal complexity and the structures of the entity that you'd need to set up possibly, if you haven't got an existing entity, the tax complexity um, around what do you need and what do you need to evidence in terms of your um, operations, and what does that entity cost look like? Um, so the, the, the entity cost is actually quite significant, uh, generally for a business. Um, and so then um, after that, you would actually then link into the public affairs and communications, which is really, uh, you know, government um, policy and um, how easy is is it to get licensing and, and actually do business within the country. And then after that, and generally, um, you'd be looking at what are the conditions of the country. So is it secure? If it's not secure, you wouldn't even go any further um, so you know if you've got an inner if we take this at country level then if you've got an inner city area that is not secure a large corporate would just uh, dismiss it uh, right from the beginning so you know security um, is very important and technology um, corporates do actually do a very um, uh, minute search if we put it that way I don't we've got uh, technical people in our audience um, but we would actually search on postcode and actually street address to look at the actual connectivity um, within that specific location if um, we were looking at um, comparative locations so that would be a key driver and obviously technology comes uh, and covers other things besides digital technology um, if you're looking at a manufacturing site for example um, then you need all the inputs that um, that technology would need. So I've, I've sort of um, grouped that as a, a very broad band um, and you've got an industrial <laughs> picture there, but this could actually be anything, you know, it, it could be sort of um, uh, residential development, it, it could be manufacturing, it could be retail, it, it could be commercial. So um, uh, that, that bracket um, covers quite a lot. I'm, I'm trying to be um, quite fast because I've only got a few minutes. Um, and, uh, and then in terms of the uh, real estate market availability, uh, cost and complexity, um, that's really, after all these other things uh, have um, been considered, um, selected, and then it's okay, so what's available? And are there the right conditions for us to operate? And I would say for a large corporate, ESG and sustainability is absolutely number one. So if the environment is not uh, appropriate, that also would be uh, completely um, deselected. And so I'm actually going to finish, and uh, before I hand back to Megan, to actually come full circle around sense of place. And I have been consulted, not in my current capacity in terms of my role, but by other developers uh, representing a generic view of a large corporate in would, you know, generically, I consider going to a place. 
and generically I've said no um, because the actual um, sense of place um, doesn't accord with uh, what a corporate would be looking for which you know is a high standard of amenity um, security and accessibility um, for all profiles of, of um, of talent. So I would actually uh, recommend um, everyone reading the sustainable placemaking in terms of the paper that the RICS is sponsoring. And um, with that, Megan, I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jill, and thanks for the terrific plug for the RICS paper. Um, so, look, that's a brilliant line to hand over to. Um, perhaps if we get the next slide up while I introduce Cathy. Um, so, finishing on a sense of place is a brilliant way to segue into Cathy to talk about um, a place, to talk about Belfast and what's been going on there. So, Cathy, over to you. Yeah, thank you, um, Megan, and thank you, Jill. That was, that was really good at that, but actually about the sense of place, I think, is, you know, is, is really important. And, because sometimes I think that gets a little bit forgotten in terms of if you just look at kind of stark kind of property, um, you know, maybe property and, and the outputs rather than, than kind of the place. But but in terms of, of Belfast, um, what, I, what I've set out here really is, is what our growth ambitions are and what is the scale of our ambition. Um, for those of you that, that, that don't know Belfast, and I'm sure I'm hoping, I'm hoping people do, but, you know, um, it's, it's one of the two kind of cities with, um, within Ireland, it um, sits then, you know, kind of perfectly positioned, if you like, even in terms of kind of between um, Dublin and, and, and the UK. And it has a, that, a, that um, I suppose, attractiveness and, and the ability to, to operate in both markets. Um, the Belfast Agenda sets out our growth ambitions. That's our community plan in terms of um, wanting to deliver um, 31, almost 32,000 new homes and significant new um, employment floor space by 2035 and increase our population by 66,000 people, which it, it, there's quite sort of ambitious growth ambitions just across the city. What that means for the city centre as well, because we're very limited city centre living at the minute, and that's one of our absolute key objectives is, is to increase our city centre living. It's fair to say we're a very young population and it's about 35% um, of our of our city is um is sort of falls into that I think it's I can't actually I'm gonna look where it says what what young means what young means to me now is something completely different and um, but it's also got the second highest um it's set to have the second highest population growth um so the spatial articulation of that is in through our local development plan which sets out the aspirations in terms of, of that from a statutory perspective but going back maybe as well, just to what Jill had talked about there, about the sense of place, that document just down in the left hand side is a bold revision for Belfast. And that is something that we've been taking forward in more recent times with the Department for Infrastructure and the Department for Communities. And that's about creating a more attractive, accessible, safe and vibrant city centre. And really focusing on that bit about making, making the, the, the centre um, attractive, livable and all of that in terms of increasing our competitiveness, both from, um, I suppose, from, from an employment perspective, but also from a living perspective. Um, we have just had um, the University of Ulster has moved into the core of our city centre just in September time, um, bringing with them 16,000 young people. We also have Queen's University. So with something like um, 44,000 um, a, a students that are uh, that are in our universities, which accounts for something like 14% of our population. We want to keep those students here. We want to, to keep them and retain them and attract new new, new people to stay, to stay. We've had a lot of student accommodation um, built within the city centre, but what we want to now is, is really to, to grow that um, the, the, um, the residential uh, population generally. And then also, under my underpinning a lot of that is that transition to inclusive zero emissions climate resilient resilient economy what i would say in terms of the bolder vision even from we started that a few years ago the climate element of that and kind of that green environmental element has become really to the fore because that also was about how we end car dominance and move to more much more kind of greener spaces attractive active and sustainable travel and, and what that means for, for the city center so um if you, if you just maybe move the next slide, please. It's probably taking a, a little minute just to move to the, the next slide, but I'll start anyway, just in terms of it. It's kind of talking about some of the game changers, I suppose, um, for Belfast. And it's, it's maybe just worth pointing out as well that, you know, in terms of kind of where it sits at in relation to employment and, and um, 
foreign direct investment and, and our growth sector. It is the top city location globally for fintech. It's in the top 10 tech cities of the future for FDI. Even through through COVID, we had a lot of um, foreign direct investment, particularly in, in the, the various growth sectors, um, fintech, health, health sectors, etc. And more recently, it, it was um, eighth in PwC's Great Growth for Cities and, and highest city in the devolved regions. Um, so it's and you know so it's a number. I think it's number two city or, or, or of choice outside Lawton for FDI. So there's a lot of a lot of foreign direct investment that's coming forward. I don't know if that slide can move. Is it Danielle that's moving the slides? Danielle, yes, how are we get them? Unfortunately, oh, not quite yet, but I have moved it. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, no problem. So, in terms of, I suppose, some of the, the kind of major, and I, I've called them on the next slide, game changers, um, are, you know, around that. We um, have a lot of waterfront regeneration has happened over the past few years, and a lot more to come. And, and one of those, one of the um, ambitions is to, to really to, to, to build on that. Um, we have an innovation and emergent innovation district um, within the core, just sort of on the edge of our city centre, coming in, into the core city centre, and a smart district. We have recently um, had a, a one billion pound Belfast region city deal, which focusing on innovation, on tourism, on new, better jobs, and that inclusive growth. Yeah, thank you. Um, around that, and um, and one of the the core projects within that is an iconic city centre tourist um, destination and that's it's it's on that piece as well about recognising that the city centre is going to need other things other than retail so city centre living being absolutely key but this being kind of a really key um, large um, tourist facility that's coming forward and then investing in infrastructure and transport as well so there's a new um, a transport hub um, and associated a a real estate a regeneration scheme around our, our transport hub and the glider that's that's coming on um, forward on foot uh, extension of the glider um that's coming forward on foot of the Belfast region and city deal so there's been significant development there's been an, a very 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 strong trajectory in terms of office development it's, it's been really key and um, the purpose built student accommodation the hotel sector the tourism sector and the one kind of sector that we we know that we have to absolutely build on is that city centre living. So in some ways that's that's both an opportunity and, and a challenge. Um, so we just maybe move on please um, to the next one. Um, and on, on the next slide really I suppose what I've tried to do is sort of is to connect in that role the real estate can play. We do know and particularly um, I suppose since COVID that the importance of, of tackling the, the sort of social, economic, and environmental issues that, that we're facing as a society is is is, is more is, is so prevalent for, for all of us. But um, even back to kind of what what Megan had talked about and, and the work that the RI, RICS had done, I do believe that the, the built environment is a really key role to to, um, to play in delivering that inclusive and sustainable growth ambitions. And I suppose thinking of it outside kind of the core, just engineering outputs, but just what are the wider benefits um, um, that they can create in terms of social value? And we've been doing some work recently um, between the, the public sector and our wider private sector partners about how we can really maximize that um as well and we've looked at that kind of those through those three lens of social economic and environmental and kind of how that and there's none of them mutually exclusive but just what that role that that um, the real estate sector can do because i suppose as as providers and i like to think of stewards of of the built environment what that can do in terms of our economy so what it can do in terms of of, of jobs in terms of um the climate um, you know, air quality and all of the bits that go with it, rather than, than just the outputs. Now, we know that that's difficult to do, particularly, um, it can be difficult to do, I suppose, in terms of of, of um, the current climate and, and cost and capital cost and how to get all of that. But there's, there's certainly, we feel there's a mechanism that that, that, that can be done. And we've been working closely, as I say, with, with our partners as to how we, we can bring that forward. So rather than going into all the detail, I was just to kind of pull out some of that in terms of kind of that placemaking, how we can revitalise communities. Um, and the bolder vision I talked about actually talked about how we start to stitch in, or not start, but how do we build and stitching in our communities, for example, in our, the border of the city centre, and um, how we can do that in terms of active, healthy um, empowerment. Um, the jobs that come out of that, you know, be that around employability and, and skills um, plan with, with 
projects that are coming forward that air quality so just looking at that through those different lenses um absolutely feel that, that there's, there's um, a lot that that um that real estate can do in, in delivering sustainable development and social value so um uh, maybe just leave it at that megan and, and move on to you so thank you very much that's great, Cathy. Thank you very much for that. Let's just move to the next slide and I'll say thank you to Cathy. So, Cathy, I thought I really enjoyed the points around um, thinking about what goes in the centre of a city if it's not retail. So that very specific decision to think about what needs to go. If it can't be retail, what is going to go in the centre of our cities? Because retail historically has been one of the things. So thinking about the student accommodation, uh, the tourism, the deliberate points around tourism and then the offices. So thank you for that. We're, I'm, I'm sure the audience will have some questions and, and we'll follow up on the q and I'm talking because I'm waiting for the next slide to come, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Chris Perkins anyway. Um, Chris, uh, perhaps drawing it all together. So we've heard from kind of like a, a, a macro sort of comparison from John, um, from Jill, uh, you know, employers incredibly important because they're paying the income stream that investors want to come and buy the role of city. So if we can pass now to you for the role of investment um, in, in levelling up. Thanks, Chris. Great. Thanks very much, Megan. And that was perfect timing as the slides slipped into the next one. Um, I think the first point to make is, I mean, I, I, I come from an investment background. M&G is all about investing for their policyholders. And it's therefore uh, important as investors that certain fundamentals can be achieved. Um, we're very much part of the levelling up agenda. We've invested significant amounts over the last number of decades, in fact. But uh, ultimately, we need attractive risk adjusted returns. So uh, we can't be purely altruistic on these sort of things. Uh, we will be accountable to our policyholders and shareholders. But I think in, in partnership uh, with local areas, that's very much achievable. So I'm going to just move around anti-clockwise on these um, the, these bubbles. Um, we'll start with the green one. And I think the first point to make is that this is a long-term agenda. Leveling up, as we've seen, has been with us a long, long time already. We've heard George Osborne sort of a decade back with the Northern Powerhouse. It may be changing its name to leveling up and so forth, but ultimately, it, I think we all know what we're talking about. And uh, we need to have this uh, overarching long-term approach to things. I think uh, the expression cathedral thinking is probably quite valuable here because uh, it uh, it, it stands for a very long time. I mean, uh, they don't, uh, they didn't get put up last year. They need to be there long, long term. We need to be able to uh, invest with confidence in the next government and the government after that and so forth in the sense that they will be alongside us. So we need cross party agreement. Uh, it's a big issue and I think that as an investor it's probably one of the biggest challenges we have that with the uh, the volatility around politics and different parties coming in with different views it does make it really hard for an investor to uh, to look longer term so cross-party agreement really important um, and also looking into multiple cycles we're not uh, here just for the following cycle and no more we need to be seeing something that is sustainable long-term investment many of our investments we've held for well over 100 years uh, so that's the first point the overarching is the long term um, <clears throat> we then move around into the the partnership piece and ultimately uh, this is where it really does work is if you've got a collaborative relationship with local operators with local government a relationship that is trusted that has been already tested and that you can see that relationship lasting the test of time that's really important and that can be private public uh, type arrangements which we've seen in the past in, in at, at scale but it can also be in a more modest way in sort of more secondary towns the other big factor which i think many of us will have seen the sort of visionary figureheads for many many years on developments uh, in big cities we've got the sort of Herb bernstein in manchester andy streets in birmingham roger madeline at uh, king's cross they've all been uh, visionary 
figureheads who have stuck with it and uh, and and seen it through and that's important for us as a partner because uh, we we want to make sure that we uh, we're together for a long time the other point is the joined up so we're down to that bottom left um bubble it's um it's all very well uh, doing things in each city uh, independent of other cities but ultimately you do need some central government coordination of this and you need this concept of connected uh, ecosystems silo thinking doesn't work you don't want competition directly between two cities both competing for the same outcome that's unhelpful you want them to be complementary so you do need that oversight of a, uh, a joined up um, connected ecosystem. Now, as Jill says, we move on to the grey bubble on ESG. Um, it is absolutely centre in all that we are doing. And as an investor, we're judged very much by that. It's driven by the occupiers as much as it is by us as landlord investors. Uh, we must have energy efficiency. We need to future proof the developments that we create. Uh, we need to look at conversions and uh, looking at the heritage of cities and towns where we can actually bring back and repurpose um, the, the, the general built environment in a way that is complementary uh, to the ESG agenda. And so the likes of some of the sort of embedded carbon uh, discussions, it plays well to that. Um, it is something, though, that is here to stay for sure. And it is a central plank in uh, our investment decision making. Um, and then we move on up to the, um, the, the, the orange bu bubble there, the jobs and the housing piece. Well, retaining skills locally is a lot of what levelling up is about. It's really important that the talent that you have in an area is comfortable staying in that area. You want them to be uh, feeling that it's an environment that provides for them, for their families. By doing uh, that, we, we therefore have to have a simplified planning process. We need to ensure that uh, it's possible to fast track initiatives and that people feel that they are, they're great places to live, that the infrastructure and the amenities in that area are such that you don't get that, uh, that drain away to the big sort of uh, big six CBD cities. The, the other point around that is that real, and we've heard it uh, several times now, that sense of community, that sense of local pride. And if you can engender that, and it's often there, but it's not being uh, it's not being nurtured, uh, these schemes will be successful because you have buy-in locally. Um, and then the last thing, which uh, is the blue box there, the, the bubble in uh, investment returns. I think as an investor, uh, we've constantly got to have a close eye on that. And in that partnership with uh, local authorities, for example, you do need realistic land values thrown in. Uh, if one is to regenerate an area to do some placemaking, uh, th there's no point in putting an unrealistic value on a, on a site if the developer who is providing the capital, the investor, isn't able to see a, uh, a decent return on that. The other point, and uh, we've certainly heard a lot more recently about um, investment zones in the news, it's important that um, those are genuinely attractive uh, tax breaks that people can have to support those investment returns. And that uh, there are ways of uh, mitigating risk because ultimately many of our policyholders are relatively risk averse we're not as a as a high certainly at mg looking for a, a highly speculative opportunistic uh, type of investment we're looking for those long-term returns so very much uh, uh, for us investing in the leveling up agenda is uh, absolutely central and we've uh, we've put about a billion into this in the last five years Equally, we can only do it if we are supported by uh, local authorities, by partnerships that understand what we're trying to achieve, and equally, that we understand what that local community is looking to achieve. So, Megan, I'll stop at that and um, pass back to you. Brilliant. Chris, thank you very much. Um, I mean, really heartening to know you've put about a billion in. I mean, this is 
definitely putting putting your money obviously putting your money where your mouth is is absolutely fantastic um and the very super long-term thinking around 100 years i mean i'm going to keep talking till they put the next slide up um with the headshots on so look that was really fantastic a wonderful summary and it really drew it all together of the different points that we've heard so far um, we've got questions coming in through the chat just to prove that this is live um, obviously I have a couple of pre-prepared questions which I'll go ahead and ask you just to kind of kick off um, if as panelists if you can see the questions I'll read them out in the chat box um, some of them uh, Jill there's definitely one for you around employment and site selection criteria so I think you can take a look at that but let me just sort of ask the general first question which we did know was coming so Chris staying with you um, while we've got you on the line and it's almost it's a bit of a theoretical philosophical philosophical question do we move the people to where the jobs are or do we move try to keep move the jobs to where the people are and the reason for asking that is around high-speed rail into city centers so to what degree should we be you know pushing forward with high-speed rail to take people to where the jobs are to make it easier for people to move to where the jobs are or should we be talking more about putting the jobs to where the people are so Chris can I ask you to weigh in on that first please yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, as we say many things, there's a balance, but I'm fundamentally of the view that you've got to move uh, jobs to the people if we're to keep the local talent in the areas that they are already established and allow people to remain in those areas. Now, of course, it's not going to be a small village that that can necessarily happen in, but if you're looking at certainly big six, but also probably the next um, tier of 30 cities across uh, Britain, cities and towns, you do need to ensure that the jobs go to those areas and that we can provide good housing, uh, that there is a strong amenity offer locally, and that um, <clears throat> local entrepreneurial flair is allowed to grow and thrive. Uh, it's, um, it, it's important that people feel good where they're based and uh, that ultimately is i think the way to, to to keep people local is to provide for them locally so back to your hs2 point um i'm not a believer that um hs2 is a drain of skills sort of down back to london um i think uh, moving labor fast is accretive to gdp whichever way it goes and we shouldn't get hung up about this sort of drain away from local regional areas. It ultimately benefits everyone. Better connectivity is good for us all and it will flow both ways. Thanks, Chris. Um, Jill, did you want to add a point on this one? Um, I don't know if this is, you know, with, with, you're very much in, in my world, you have the jobs in your remit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine, um, Megan. Thank you. I, I agree with absolutely everything that Chris has um, discussed. Um, I would like to reiterate a connected ecosystem approach. So if we actually look back at history, um, we had specialised centres uh, in the UK. So we had Sheffield for steel and we had um, Manchester for cotton and, and wool and they weren't competing. And I think Chris made that point in, in his discussion and I uh, would like to see a more complementary approach um, from an ecosystem Point of view. So you have specialist centres. I mean, currently we have uh, Leeds and Edinburgh's um, financial centres outside London, um, and we, you know, there are uh, other cities would have other um, key advantages that need to be pulled out more. I would say. Um, so I would say there is a balance. Um, I think um, we could do a better job of um, a more connected approach and actually understanding what the different places can offer. Thanks Jill. So it sounds like we're sort of broadly in agreement about that we need to keep the jobs to the people. So with that in mind, um, Cathy and then John, perhaps I can come to you for a question more about what do you want the government to do? So, you know, this is, I really enjoyed everything I've learned today on the webinar. If there were a couple of things that you wanted the government to do to kind of aid um investment for economic regeneration what would you want this government or this government or the next government kathy what would you want them to do and then john perhaps you could give me some examples of perhaps other locations or what you'd like to see the government do yeah thank you megan i suppose um in terms of um you know the leveling up 
funding bids, um, etc., um, can take up a lot of time as well. And you know, there's significant competition, you know, for funding opportunities at, at a city and regional level. But I think there's some basics, you know, just even we talk about that level playing field, and be that around connectivity or infrastructure. You know, what we find is that, um, you know, even in terms of getting, you know, bringing forward large regeneration schemes, that support and infrastructure, um, to get them. To, you know, ready to go sometimes is, is the blocker either in terms of, you know, timing, viability and the bit about, you know, in terms of attractiveness. I think it would be, I suppose we're a bit different, you know, in Belfast as well, because our, our um, even in terms of how we're structured in terms of kind of central government and local government, we don't have all the same powers that, that other councils do have across the water. But, you know, whilst we don't well, I suppose we don't want to compete per se. Investment decision makers will look at other cities. So they're going to look to see, you know, what's viable in one city, what's not viable in, in another city. So I think that kind of ensuring that there is a level playing field, even in terms of parity of funding that, that is across the board. Um, you know, we don't, for example, have the, you know, have the equivalent of the of um, Homes England or the uh, Stronger Towns Fund or the High Street funding. So it might come across in different ways, but it's just kind of having that level playing field, um, you know, even including the, the devolved nations and and looking at some of the fundamentals, particularly around that support and infrastructure to get um, to get things kick started. Thanks, Cathy, and thank you for reminding us of the devolved areas and the fact that, you know, I'd forgotten this, that the, the different areas of the UK operate in really very different ways. So, so thank you for sharing on that. John, what, what's your view on this? Well, I think what you want to see uh, the government do, I think you need to see a proper, um, proper kind of uh, rapid transport network in cities like Birmingham and Leeds, for a start off. I think you need to improve the connections between Leeds and Manchester in particular, because that's a very weak connection there. I've got that a few times. It takes like 50 minutes to get about 30 miles, and they're obviously two sort of powerhouses in the north. Uh, and just generally transport, I think, is really important. The, the, the R&D budget needs to be more skewed towards the north and the Midlands. Um, and, you know, I think uh, the skills skills issues as well. And I think that, you know, a lot of that can be solved by more devolution of powers. I mean, if you look at what, I'll go back to French cities again, you know, the um, the, the French government um, put in place a, um, a, a sort of local tax, really, that the other governments didn't have to use. They had to go through a referendum, but they could impose this local tax. And local tax had to be used specifically for transport schemes. And, you know, cities like uh, Bordeaux and Lille, have built you know quite extensive tram networks in the last 30 years using that tax. They don't have to use it, and it obviously has to be democratically approved. Um, and also, what what's often happened is that's gone hand in hand with planning, and in fact, it has to be put in place for it to, to work. And the um, you know in Lille, for example, in certain areas in the city, there is a special planning zone around the tram stops. Not it's not taken out of local authority control, but it's there. And within that area. You have to build mixed use to a certain density uh, where you don't get planning consent, basically. And that's meant that they've tried to align the development of the city with the, with the development of the transport network. And the same has happened in cities like Montpellier, where they've, you know, they've built the tram first and then tried to get the, um, the investment in. Um, and they've also um, you know, made, it, made density happen and intensity happen in locations around stops. And you can find plenty of places in the north of England where they're still building low density suburban homes next to rail networks that could take, um, you know, thousands of people a day into the city and, it, it, you know, and all next to massive amounts of service parking, which seems a bit perverse to me. But I, I think, you know, we, we don't think very carefully. We don't do enough transport. When we do do it, we don't think enough about linking it with planning and housing. John, thanks for that. And I think the points around uh, the trams and increasing density is just really, really well made. Um, we amazingly have only got six minutes left and we've got a couple of wrapping up slides to do as well. So I just want to ask one more um, question. And uh, actually, um, it's to kind of to Jill and Chris around um, this. So to, to John's point about the government providing, the government can provide what you would describe as public goods. Uh, the tram system might be described as a public good and the government has a responsibility to provide public goods perhaps digital infrastructure physical infrastructure um uh, so chris coming to you with your hundred year view are there some that was a great example from lil are there some other sort of key ideas that you think that the government ought to be doing as part of this leveling up i'm thinking about the public goods part 
Yes, I think that uh, in terms of um, funding initiatives, uh, I think that's certainly very key. And to have uh, the availability of, uh, of capital, perhaps it's, uh, it's green type funding and initiatives to support that. I think secondly, to uh, really, I think, big up the uh, investment zone concept because those do act as a catalyst. There are some great examples of those in the past with the enterprise zone concept and they've worked well. And this is obviously a, a variation of that, but uh, we need to see that from the government. And that is a long term framework in which then private investment can take place. Thank you for bringing up the investment zones. Can I ask anybody else want to weigh in on investment zones particularly? Uh, hi, Megan. Uh, just from me, only that from a corporate point of view, the simpler you can make it, the better. And it doesn't have to be corporate, any business, really. Um, there's enough hurdles um, to, to get along in terms of operations um, without, you know, the complexities of, of setting up. So um, I would say anything that the government can do um, to fast track its green agenda, the balance that we talked about uh, and simplicity um, um, would be very helpful. Brilliant. Well, Jill, thank you for that. Well, look, honestly, we've got three minutes left and I want everyone to finish the webinar promptly on time to go home and have their cups of tea or take their trams to get home. Um, so I'm going to thank everybody there. We heard some fantastic ideas. Um, Kathy, in particular, Belfast City Centre, the increasing numbers of people you've got coming in there through the universities. From John, we had some great ideas about the trams. From Chris, an overarching picture and a billion pounds going into um, investment and out of the UK and finishing with Jill there with her points on investment zones. So I, I've really enjoyed this webinar. We've got some questions that we've had around employment and site selection. So we'll perhaps take a moment to write back to people if we know the email addresses of people who've asked a couple of the questions. So um, can I ask, I don't know if the next slide can come up. We did promise that we put back up the two reports uh, that the RICS has done. There we go. Fantastic. UK commercial real estate impact report. I'd really like to you know, highlight both of those again and, and tell you to go to the RICS website and download them. I think on the next slide then we're going to feature the upcoming webinars, uh, a plug for the next couple. Um, I think the next one should be on the 3rd of November, which I'm pretty certain is the next day for the UK, for the Bank of England uh, rate rise. I think that's why I've got the 3rd of November firmly in my head um, and the other ones you've got coming through right through to the 14th of December, the year in review. Um, so with that, I'd like to really thank everyone, thanking the panellists today. Um, for more information, uh, please join us. Chris, do you want to say thank you and goodbye so and everybody else give us a wave? Yes, indeed. Uh, apologies, our firewall wasn't behaving properly, but uh, good to be on this uh, last hour. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Ray. Thank you to everybody for coming. Cheers, guys. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.